Um, so my name is Cynthia Olmedo, and I do want to give a disclaimer. I am at my house. It is very loud here. Um, so if you hear background noise, um, literally plane, trains, cars, two dogs, two birds, uh, and children. So I will go ahead and get started. Uh, and Rowan will be able to, I believe, manage the chats if you ask a question in the chat room. And Priyanka as well will be assisting. Um, but if you have any questions, just feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. I, I don't mind. You can interrupt me at any time. Okay. So this workshop is going to be discussing uh, financial psychology, budgeting, debt, uh, credit, and credit reports are some of the things. Unfortunately, this is a very a basic uh, pres uh, workshop. So we don't go into like short-term investments or how to do your taxes, anything like that. That would be uh, take a lot longer. So um, on this, we'll go ahead and skip this just for, for time's sake. Uh, I usually am interested in knowing who is in this presentation, what your major is, you know, uh, what year you are in college, and then what you hope to gain from this presentation. If you were looking for financial information that is not part of this presentation, you can feel free to get my email at the end of the presentation and just email me and I will be able to provide you with those resources, whether it is talking about investments or taxes or, or anything like that. I'm more than willing to look up that information um, and provide that to you. So uh, these are some financial literacy surprises uh, that I came across when I started teaching this course. So paying rent on time does not increase your credit score when you want to buy a house. I did not know that. I just thought, you know, you pay your rent on time, it's gonna look good for when you wanna buy a house. But unfortunately it doesn't because you are renting the house, you're not buying the house. Uh, so that's one thing. And then having no credit is also not helpful. Um, you have to have somebody that's willing to trust you. So you have to have a history of paying people back. So that's why no, you must have credit in order for that to be helpful. Um, third, the government will garnish your wages for federal loans and taxes owed, unfortunately. Um, so that is a real thing. It will happen. Um, you may need a credit card to rent certain items. So I found this out and go on vacation and try to rent a car uh, or something like that that's a little more expensive. Uh, I gave him a debit card because, you know, I didn't, I wanted to stay away from credit cards. Those are known as kind of evil to me, right, when I was in college. Um, but the thing is that they wanted a credit card because, unfortunately, there's not enough money in your debit card usually to cover, like, if you're running a car and it's an expensive car, um, there's not enough in that debit card to cover the cost of that. So they will ask for a credit card. Um, so it could be important to have a credit card to rent certain things. Also, uh, federal aid, uh, uh, federal financial aid loans are always better than credit card options. So if you get through the semester uh, and then realize you need to take some summer courses and maybe your financial aid doesn't cover the summer courses, um, you might be tempted to just go and get a credit card. Say you owe just like $1,000 for a class and it may be easy to just go to a credit card, but you know the interest rates are extremely high on credit cards. So you wanna always just go to your financial aid office and ask, can you get another loan? Because the interest rates on those federal financial aid loans are gonna be so much lower uh, than a credit card. Um, and then increasing your credit card limit is not an award. So if you have a credit card, you know that if you pay it on time, they're gonna eventually give you a higher limit, right? Um, it seems really nice that they give you more money, more money to spend, but remember, it's not an award. It's actually more of a trap, you know, because you didn't use or you've been being responsible with the money that they gave you so that now they want to see if they can give you a little bit more and see if you're going to be equally as responsible. So there's a question on the chat. What does garnish and wages mean? It means that from your paycheck, they will actually take the money out of your paycheck. Like when you get the paycheck, whatever you owe them, you're going to have that much less. 
Good question. Thanks for asking that. Okay, I'll go on to the next question. Oh, is there more questions? No, that's all for now. Okay. So uh, lifestyle activity. So um, what does financial freedom look like for you? So everybody has an idea in their head of what financial freedom is. It could be traveling around the world, going on vacations, you know, staying at uh, nice resorts, just living it up. Maybe that's your financial freedom. Or it could be you just want a really high credit score. You want to be able to buy what you want to buy, you know, um, and have good credit. Okay, have uh, those opportunities and options available to you. Or you may know already in your head, you need uh, a five bedroom house and he's have three bathrooms and he's have a pool, the patio. So you may already have this image in your head of what you want. Okay, so those, those are different things to different people was, is what financial freedom looks like. But if those are the things you know you want, you need to write down your financial goals, just like any other goal you have to write them down. And in order for it to be a goal, you have to have a deadline, okay? So if you say uh, you have a financial goal of you wanna purchase a house by the time you're 30, or you wanna pay off your student loan debt by the time you're 35, you just wanna make sure that you're very detailed when you write down those financial goals. Um, so that you aspire to them. And as every day you make financial decisions, um, you know, you make them towards those goals. So, and then usually when we're in the workshop, you know, full of students in the classroom, I ask what are some barriers to those goals that you have in mind? Um, so I'll share some of the most common ones that are given to me. Those barriers to, towards those financial goals are the student loan debt that they know that they will have to pay back. Or it may be credit card debt that you know you're going to have to pay back. Uh, and of course, the other one is employment. You know, if you want the house, you have to be able to be making a certain amount of money to be able to pay for the house you'd like. And so that comes down to employment. What job am I going to get? Uh, how much are they going to pay me? So those are things that people see as barriers. And that's really why career services is there so that you can practice practice for looking for the job you want, earning the income that you want, uh, landing the interview, negotiating the salary, um, are th all things that would help you eliminate that barrier. So financial psychology. Um, financial psychology, it's a unique subject um, because of the emotional ties that people have to money. Okay, so in class, you know, you study math, you study history, geography, all those different things. And, and those are great. Um, but the thing is that you are going to use uh, your financial um, knowledge every single day of your life. You're going to spend money every single day. Hopefully you're going to earn money every single day. But there are emotional ties to money. And those stem from, from really from childhood, uh, in case you didn't realize. Um, and then all financial decisions are really based on two key emotions when you think about it, whether they're happy emotions like you won the lottery or whether uh, it's a more difficult emotion. Like perhaps not being able to pay the bills. Okay, so those two key emotions that every single financial decision you make is based on are gonna be greed and fear, okay? Fear that you won't have enough, fear that you're uh, not gonna earn enough, and it could be greed, like maybe I didn't ask for enough money. I always tell people, you know, you know sometimes when you may find uh, $5 in the parking lot, you know, and as soon as you find it, then sometimes our instinct is to, oh, I wish it had been 20. I mean, we're happy that it's $5, right? We found $5 we didn't have before. Um, but it's like, we want a little bit more. And that's the same thing with when you earn a salary. So sometimes, you know, we're happy with the income that we were offered. We took the offer and we're glad. But, you know, once you hear someone else in the company is making more, then we tend to be like, ah, you know, it, it changes your whole mood. 
So in the next, so give some thought to what influences you to make your purchases. When you buy something, why are you buying it? Are you buying it because you need it or because you want it? Because everyone else has it. You know, so just be careful to pay attention to what actually influences uh, the purchases that you make. Also, do advertisers uh, affect your spending habits? You know, people in marketing, they do a really great job at designing commercials that make you really want their products. Um, Apple does a great job at that. Um, their commercial, commercials are very effective. Um, same thing with car commercials, um, vacations, just all those different things. So just make sure that you're aware when you're watching those advertising commercials um, to see if it is affecting your, your spending habits. And, and then how do you feel when you don't have the money uh, to make a purchase? So that's one of those things that can, can be very emotional because you can get very angry when you can't afford something that you want. Um, but you know, sometimes even that can cause you to make bad decisions because if you don't have the money, but you really, really want it. And you may think, Hey, I'm a student. I work, I go to school every day. I make good grades. I, I deserve this. You know, I earned it cause I'm a hardworking student. So I'm going to buy it anyway, you know, and then you may just put it on a credit card and get it because you know, you deserve it right so we kind of have to watch those emotional decisions as well because they can get us in a bind budgeting budgeting is a financial roadmap um what method do you use for managing your money so this one if you would like to unmute yourself um i just want to know if anybody has a method that they use to manage their money um you know it's it's different times. Nobody uses a checkbook anymore to actually write down. At least I don't think they do. Um, but how do you know how much money is coming in and how much money is coming out that you have enough to pay for uh, what you need? Does anybody want to share any of the methods that they use to manage their money? I'll share. Okay. I'm Bianca. Bianca, thanks. So personally, I have this long-term goal of um, wanting to move to New York after I graduate. And the rent is very expensive, obviously. Yes. So that's something that I'm definitely saving for long-term. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, what I struggle with is um, my income varies because I just work like a sales associate, like retail job. So you know, mm -hmm. it just depends how many hours you get scheduled every week. Um, so I don't have like a set dollar amount that I set aside from my income every week. Okay. Um, rather, I do a percentage from mm -hmm. my paycheck into my savings every week. So I don't know if that's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. That's great. And we're going to, we'll discuss that. So that's great. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. um, I can share. Great. Okay. Who, who's that? That's me, Rowan. Rowan, oh, okay. Sorry. I, didn't recognize I you. used a really nice app that helped me saving, so I didn't use to save before. I was like, just, you know, spending for my checking and whatever. And then there's this app on my phone. It's called Digit. It's basically like, um, it takes a random amount, like based, based on your spending, takes random amount from your checking accounts and saves it. Uh, you know, saves it for you and the app. So you really like forget, and that's like on a daily basis. So you really like, you forget about the app. But one mm -hmm. time, like if you check the app, like after two weeks, you're like, whoa, I saved this amount of money. That's really great, you know? And it doesn't cost, like it only costs like $5 a month. So this has really like helped me with saving like my money. Okay, that's great. I can share, I just use a more basic method right now um, and uh, for managing money, like the, the month to month, I just use Excel. So I just put in how much, you know, um, you know, the light bill is and the phone bill is and the mortgages and, and all those different things. And so I know what that total should be, even though it varies a little bit every month. Um, so yeah, that's, that's just what, what I use um, is Excel. Um, 
What do you do when you need something that is over your budget? Um, does anybody have any, any things that they're go-to for when they need to buy something? Bianca again. Okay. Great. So whenever I can't afford something, uh -huh. I put it on my credit card. Uh -huh. Luckily, I have a lot of savings. Mm -hmm. So I try not to ever carry a balance on my right. card. Um, so like if it comes to that situation, like for example, my laptop just mm -hmm. died on me um, the other <sighs> month. And so I took out of my savings. But I replenish my savings again with like the percentage method for my paycheck so that I don't have to like, you know, put all my paychecks right back into savings. I just replenish it and uh -huh. that on top of what I would regularly put into savings. Okay. That's great. Yeah, that's really good. Uh, so one scenario that I, I give people um, when, you know, when you are living paycheck to paycheck, um, which can be the case a lot of times when you're in college um, is when you need something that's over your budget, but it's in an emergency. Uh, so for example, if you've ever had your car towed on campus before, I can tell you it's usually a little over $300. And if you don't have that $300, then I like to see what methods students have to getting that money. So some of the first methods, um, that students will say is usually like family, family and friends, they'd ask their parents for the money or a friend. But if you have family and friends, they don't have the money, then, then what's your next step? If you have a credit card, then that's definitely an option that, um, that people would choose. But if they don't have a credit card, um, there are a lot of other options which are, are not, not good options, um, but they are out there. Um, some people have mentioned like title loans, like if they had a car that they paid off, they go to title loan places, uh, or they may start pawning things, you know, um, and those are decisions that sometimes they, they feel that they have to make. And of course, those are not recommended. And we want to make sure that you are saving money to prevent you having to go to those options. Um, so below that, we have the three budgets that you should have. So the current budget is just your month to month, the things that you pay, that you pay for every single month. Um, and then your emergency budget is just exactly for that. So you want to make sure you have an emergency budget that's only for emergencies and you don't touch it because, you know, there's, you know, um, something new on sale that you want. Um, but that emergency budget is going to be used usually for that. Like if you get your car towed or um, if you get in a car accident and they happen to just hit you and then just take off. Um, the amount usually minimum that I'd say needs to be in that emergency budget would be 500. And the reason I say 500 at minimum is because that's usually uh, what you would have to pay if you got in a car accident. Um, you know, and, and you'd have to pay that down in order to get your car fixed um, if the other person didn't have insurance and they just left. Um, and then the last one is the long-term budget. Um, so the long-term budget is for those future things that you know, whether you want to buy a house um, after you graduate, a couple years after you graduate, or maybe you're planning to take a trip to Europe after you graduate, take some time off and do that. Um, so just a longer term budget um, can be used for those things that are saving things, goals that you have written down and you're going to be using that, those funds for that. But budgeting all in all, it allows you to handle any uh, unexpected expenses, okay, so that you don't have to take from one budget for another budget. And let me know if you have any questions. Feel free to unmute and ask questions at any time. So how do you like separate those budgets? Like do you have separate accounts for each one or mm -hmm. how would you do that? Yes, so I do. I have a regular checking account uh, for my month to month. And then I have a credit union account because credit unions are not always as available as banks are. 
So I will give a plug for TDECU that we have on campus. They are a terrific credit union. Um, so I have a savings with them. And then I have one with a Shell Credit Union. So I separate those. And so from my paycheck, those automatically, a certain amount of money goes to those. So I don't even touch it. I don't see it because it's not part of my monthly budget. Um, and that's really the easiest way to do it because once you have it, it it's a little bit harder to, to set aside. How do you automatically um, sort those without seeing the money? Well, I do it from my direct deposit. So when I, when I don't get a physical check, so if it's direct deposited, there's usually a way that you can go in there and ask for a different account. So when you put your checking account number in to your direct deposit, there's more options. So you can add other uh, institutions on there. And I just tell them, you know, how much I want to go to this one and how much I go to that one. So that's how I never see it. So you do it like percentage wise. Mm -hmm. um, you tell them I want 20% to go to TD, ECU. And yes, I actually don't. What I do is I, ca I calculate the percentage myself. Mm -hmm. And so I know if that's like $300, then okay, I just I, I put it $300. I don't let them calculate it. I just okay. put $300 goes to you and then, you know, 150 goes to you. Okay. Yeah. There is a question on the chat from Jocelyn or Jocelyn. Okay. Uh, would, you, would you recommend this now as a student or once graduated and in a career? I would recommend it now just because you're developing that relationship with that credit union now. So that way when you need something later on, like you want to buy a new car after you graduate or something like that, you already have established that relationship with them. Yeah, even if it's not a lot, it doesn't matter how much you're saving, at least you have it open. Can you create separate saving accounts with the same credit union or bank? Or does it all have to be different? No, you, I, I believe you can create um, different ones with the same bank. So if I have one savings account right now, mm -hmm. could I like open a separate account and like keep 500 in the pre-existing one and then allocate the rest to a long-term account? Is that what I... I would recommend doing that, especially um, depending on the interest rate that they give you. If you're going to be making money off of that, then I would do that. So I try to find the, the best deal. So if I'm going to be saving money with them, but they have a higher, I'm going to be earning a higher interest rate on what's sitting there in their bank, then I'm going to open a different one. But if you're doing a good job at saving it in one, then, I mean, that's fine as well. But later down the road, you might want to um, open another one. No, I definitely want to open another one just because mm -hmm. like, I don't want to keep touching my savings yeah. account like whenever those little things happen. So, mm -hmm. so if everyone has the higher interest rate, it should be the long-term budget. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. See, and then it breaks down. Here's how it should be broken down um, as far as your basic budgeting. Um, just dividing your income. Now, these percentages are just like recommendations. They, they can be adjusted, you know, um, by a few percent. But the bulk, of course, is going to go to your living expenses, your month to month, things that you have to have, you know, your food, your lights, um, your rent, things like that. So that should be 60%. So when they talk about like living within your means, um, that's that 60%. Okay, because uh, then you can live comfortably with that 60%. 20% is recommended for saving, uh, 10 for investing. Now, investing can be a lot of things. It doesn't mean you have to go out and get like stocks and bonds or things like that. Um, but um, investing, as far as a college student, you are investing because you're a student. So you're paying your tuition. That in itself is an investment. So, um, but that 10% can go to, to investing. And then the last is just for charity, just for any organizations that you may want to give to churches, things like that. Any questions about that? There is a question from Jennifer. She okay. says, um, 
Which banks do you personally use for saving? I have TDE, C, uh, TDECU, but mm -hmm. I'm not sure if there are other banks out there that will give me more uh, for money setting in my savings. Mm -hmm. Well, usually any credit union is gonna give you more for your savings than, than a bank, but you would have to shop around. Um, I like TDECU. I also do like uh, the Shell Credit Union as well. Um, anything that it's, if you have one that's attached to your employer, those are usually good. Um, I used to have one with um, Harris County when I worked for Harris County. Uh, I used to use theirs. So everybody has um, their own affiliations with, if they have a credit union affiliated with your employer, with your school, those are the most recommended. What what's the difference between a credit union and a bank? So a credit union, you are actually a, a shareholder of that. So they're not supposed to be as much like a bank is more for business. They they make money right off of the fees and things like that. But uh, a credit union uh, is supposed to be more community as you're a part of it. That's the way I've heard it explained explained to me. I do I do know that. There, there is a difference that the interest rates are higher, the deals are better. Like whenever you go to get a loan for anything, the, the interest rates are lower. Like if you're gonna get a car or house at a credit union. So um, that's how I've had it explained to me. So are credit unions more of like a regional kind of thing, like local? Yes. Okay, so would it make sense for me to put my money into a credit union if I'm planning to move out of state post graduation? Oh, that's a that's a good question. <laughs> I mean, you could still I mean, because everything's done online anyway, for the most part. So I don't think that would make a difference. But I, I personally, I would wait for credit union, like if you're going to move, Mm -hmm. I would look for credit unions that are in, in that area. Once it's like full-time employment. Right, right. Because um, like with Shell, they're not everywhere. Credit unions are not mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they don't have as many as banks. So that's what makes it harder to go get your money. Their hours are, are shorter are also. They aren't open the way they have bank hours open. Gotcha. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's what I would recommend. Uh, one more question about the previous slide. Mm -hmm. So for the three budgets, the current emergency and long-term budget, mm -hmm. would you be dividing your 20% savings or, or just your total income? No, I would divide um, the total 20. Yeah, between those, between those budgets. Okay. Yeah, because that's just too much money. I see. Yeah. So, and then you can adjust those as needed because not everybody, you know, gives to charity, not everybody like has an investment. So you could put more towards savings if you wanted. So now we'll step into credit and how is your credit? You know, that's a, a very common question you get asked a lot, um, especially after you graduate. Um, I can tell you with my credit as a college student, I, I did have a credit card because you start getting credit cards usually as soon as you turn 18 years old, right? They just start sending them to you in the mail, like nothing. Um, but I was told, you know, you pay off your balance, that's all you need to do. And it will help your credit, which was fine. When I was a college student, it was very easy to do that. Um, it wasn't until after college that I found it extremely hard to do that. Um, so credit is defined, uh, it's the ability of a customer to obtain goods and services before payment based on the trust that a payment will be made in the future. Uh, and that's what, what credit is. Now, why do you need good credit? Uh, good credit will affect the payments, the interest rate, and the length of time that you pay on a loan. Uh, even though it may be the same, the same item being purchased, if you have good credit and someone else has bad credit, they are going to pay more. And I have some detailed slides on, on that. Um, 
So as far as credit scores, um, these are FICO scores, how they're rated. Um, I don't know if everybody knows their credit score. Uh, some people try to avoid it since they feel like they can't do anything about it right now, but um, 800 to 850 is impeccable credit, which very few have. Um, 700 to 790, excellent credit. Most people fall in between the 650 and 690 at good credit. Um, 620 to 640 is fair credit, and then 610 or below is poor credit. So the better your credit score, the lower that your interest rate should be. If you have a higher credit score, you can ask them a lot of times, ask your creditors to lower your interest rate. Uh, the translation here is um, you will pay less to borrow the same amount of money as someone who has a bad credit score. And we will talk about what affects your credit score. I have a question. Sure. If that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so as far as, um, because I have a credit karma and yes. I noticed that my credit score with TransUnion and Equifax varies a lot different from what Experian says that my credit score is. So I'm just trying to figure out which one between um, you know, credit karma and Experian is more accurate. Yeah, they're, they're not, it's not like an accurate thing. It's like each one is just different and different loan places will use different credit unions. Uh, I'm sorry, we'll use the, the different, the different ones, the different scores. So some will use TransUnion, some will use Experian. So it just depends on the one that they use. Now I know mine, when I look at, cause I have credit karma as well and I love credit karma. It does a really good job. Um, but mine are usually only varied by a couple of points difference. So I, I haven't, which one did you say was w way different? My experience, I Ex think it's maybe um, 20 to 25 point difference between oh, wow. that one and the one that um, is on Credit Karma with the, the other two credit bureaus. Right, right, TransUnion, yeah. Um, but the thing is, they won't average them whenever you're going to get a loan. They will choose one. And so hopefully it's just, it's not that one. That's, that's what you'd want to do. But I, I don't know what, why the difference would be, because I've only seen differences by a couple of points, not 20 points. Unless there's something being reported on that one that's different. Have you pulled your credit report to look through it? Actually, now that I think about it, um, I remember that... Um, Experian, it takes them a while to um, kind of catch up with things. So mm -hmm. I think that may be what it is because um, I had a, a credit limit raised on mm -hmm. one of my credit cards. And then I noticed that um, I, I believe I had a boost in my points there. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was something else that I had in collections that I paid off and mm -hmm. I believe it, it hasn't been reflected in Experian yet. Okay. And I think that that is what it may be. Yeah. Yeah. And you can definitely check your, your credit report, like once a year, pull it, go through it. Um, and it'll have everything that's being reported. Um, if you've had things in collections, it kind of has when things are going to fall off. So it's, it's good to keep track of what's on there and make sure that you understand everything that's on there and nothing belongs to someone else, you know, because there is a lot of fraud that goes on as well. Okay, thank you. Sure, no problem. So this, I went um, kind of house hunting. Um, this house was like in Pearland, and I went on the HAR website and found this house. You can see it's four bedroom, two bath, built in 96, square footage, um, it has a private pool. And then we have um, Rachel and Monica, because I'm a Friends fan. So you can see Rachel's score is 620. Uh, Monica's score is 790. And we'll see what that means for them in buying the same house. So the interest rate given to Rachel, uh, and I had these numbers run by a, a, an underwriter, uh, ran these numbers for me. Um, so the interest rate given to Rachel was a 4.5 interest rate. So her monthly payment for this house is 1520 per month. But 255 of those dollars are for her interest. Whereas Monica, you can see she got a 3.25 interest rate uh, and she pays 1,306 per month. Not a huge difference, 
right, in their month to month, but only $41 is going to, to her interest. Then looked at a car. Um, this car was on Craigslist. So you can see it's like fully loaded, but it's, you know, it's a used car. It's a 2012 Infinity. Uh, so as you can see with the house, the interest rates are lower. And then with cars, it starts to go up. So Rachel gets a 10% interest rate. So for this vehicle, she's going to pay $531 per month and 114 of that is going to interest. Whereas Monica, has a 3% interest rate. Uh, her payment is only $4.49 per month and $32 is going to interest. And the credit cards, which has the highest, usually highest interest rates for credit cards are ranging um, between 8% to 29.99% 20 usually is the range for a credit card. So very high interest rates um that will change that can change at any moment um so a five thousand dollar credit card um the interest rate that rachel has is 28 percent interest rate so her monthly payment uh, minimum monthly payment would be 206 dollars per month with 59 dollars going to her interest and then monica has an eight percent interest rate um 156 dollars per month with only nine dollars going to her interest so that's really good, saving her money. So the difference between the two, when you add their house, their credit card, and their car, um, is that Rachel's paying $2,257 per month, whereas Monica's paying $1,911 per month, okay, because of the credit score. Per year, when you times 12, uh, then Rachel's paying 20, 27084 per year, or Monica's paying 22000 932 per year. So it does add up, even though when we went through them individually, it only looked like, oh, an extra 200 here. Not, not a big difference, but it adds up over time. So you can see that having good credit saved Monica $4,152 per year. And that was just for these three items. Does anybody have any questions about that? How does interest accumulate on credit cards? How does it accumulate? So with the APR, they will actually calculate it for you. It's a law that was passed to where they're not gonna make you calculate it. Although there are a lot of APR calculators that you can put in the amount. But what it does is when you have a credit card balance and then you, the credit card is due and you don't pay or you pay the minimum, whatever is left on there for the next month that interest is being calculated daily on that amount. So depending on what your interest rate is for that credit card, then you, there's a lot of calculators for that where you can put in the amount and it'll calculate the APR. They tell you on the statement what your APR is and then it'll calculate it for you. But they actually have to put it on the credit card statement now. I'll show you that in, in just a few minutes. Thanks. Go ahead. Um, so, you know, when you say like paying a minimum and having um, some balance in your credit card, you know, mm -hmm. like after paying the minimum, uh -huh. does that affect credit score? Does that lower the credit score? No, no. As long as you're paying the minimum, you're fine. It okay. doesn't, that's what they want you to do. They want you to do that because, I mean, it's helping your credit because you are paying the minimum, but it's costing you money because whatever money is sitting there still borrowed, then they're accumulating interest on that money. Yeah, and what do you mean by like, uh, they're calculating it daily? Like so, the APR. So say over a time, if you um, buy something on your credit card, uh, every after that month when you don't pay it off, every single day after that, there is a daily interest rate. So that annual percentage rate, when you break it down, um, into months and then into days, it's every single day that you're not paying it, you are paying more money on it. Mm. So it does actually accumulate per day. Wow, thank you. Yeah, yeah, it does. And I can send you um, a video on how that works because you know, it's a, it's a lot of math involved, but, um, but yeah, when I learned that, and so, if you pay it earlier, you have to find out what the their calculations are, what their cycle is for their credit card.
But once you find that, you want to pay it off as soon as possible. You don't want to just wait till the end of the month because then you're paying for all of those days. I got and, you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Somebody else had another question. Yeah, I was going to ask about um, what the difference is between the uh, living, like the 60% living uh -huh. versus the current category on the budget. That is, that is going to be just about the same thing. Yeah, the living budget, because those are the, just the needs that you have to pay for. So those should be a part. Well, see, the current budget is going to also count for, like, I want to go to the movies. I want to go to a restaurant, mm -hmm. you know, entertainment, which is not really a need, but it's things that you are going to spend money on. So that's going to be part of your current budget, your monthly payment, even though it's not technically a, a need. Okay, so um, the living the living budget is basically the same as the current budget. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, I've heard that if you, uh, like, whenever you're paying your credit card, if you leave some balance off, it actually helps your um, your credit score go up as opposed to, like, paying the whole thing off. Is that true? Yeah, it's a little bit because like if you just pay it off, it's like you're not, mm, they're not entrusting you. Remember how credit is to trust you that you're going to pay it. So it, it tends to just increase it just a few points. Just so to have a small, much? to have a small, carry a small balance. So what would, like, what would be, like, well, how much is small? You know, like how much are you supposed to leave? I mean, on? I put just like just like getting gas or because it can just has to be anything okay, fifty dollars so mm -hmm. uh sorry so you're saying like you're gonna pay like let's say you know you have 300 and you pay like 250 on there would you just like leave 50 yeah that's fine okay. so there's like so anything like is there a number that you should kind of shoot for in terms of like leaving the balance no, not really. I mean, you, I think 50 is good because you don't want to leave a huge balance on there. Okay. You know, it's kind of like you're buying to, you're paying money to increase your credit score. Yeah. So, but if you have a credit card and you leave it sitting there and you, you know, like you stash it away, like it's evil. I'm not going to put anything on it. That doesn't help your credit score because it's not being used. Does, so. it, does it lower it or it just leaves it as is? It, it just leaves it. It just doesn't help. Okay. Um, I was going to tell you this later, but what will hurt it is if you do close it. Okay. Yeah. So, so when people say, should I just like cancel my credit card? You never want to cancel your credit card um, because it will hurt your credit score unless you know that you cannot be trusted and you are going to use it and you shouldn't be using it. If you, if, if you know you're going to um, kind of abuse it, then that's when you would want to just cancel the credit card. But hopefully you can just stash it away and act like it doesn't exist and, and don't actually cancel it. So there's no way to like get out of having a credit card once you've applied and received a credit card. It's like a lifetime commitment. Um, yeah, and it, wouldn't, it doesn't hurt if it just sits there. I mean, it will expire, but they'll send you another one once it expires. Can you opt out of them sending you one? Like, would it be oh, yes. possible to be like, I don't want it? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, but that wouldn't hurt your credit score. No. Okay. Mm -mm. So these are some, uh -huh. go ahead. No, if you have another question. Uh, just having, so I think that having more credit cards and paying them off will increase your credit score, right? Yes. So how do you like, balance using more than one card or like how like would you do it like oh groceries are for this card or blah 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 you know yeah yeah you can do that um you just want to pay attention to the interest rate on them you want to know what interest rate is on each one of them so i i suggest you keep that on an excel spreadsheet and then also what the limit is for the credit cards as well because sometimes you know they say like certain like american express like not everybody takes american express but they say like when you travel around the world, then you want to use your American Express. So different people take different cards. So that's another reason why I have multiple cards is because not everybody, I mean, just about everybody takes the MasterCard and Visa, but not everybody takes American Express or Discover. 
but a lot of times those have a higher uh, credit limit on those two cards. So if you're gonna travel, then you're gonna wanna carry one of those. When it comes to how many credit cards you have, I will say it's kind of like juggling. So only you know how much you can handle. Um, the reason I say like if you have multiple credit cards open and you know you close one of them, um, then it lowers your credit scores because for them, it's kind of like when you see somebody juggling and they have two balls, you know, and then they have three balls, they're juggling four and five. Well, somebody's juggling five balls, you're really impressed, right? But when they put one of the balls down, it's like, okay, they were juggling five, but now they're just juggling four. It's like less impressive, right? Because you were able to manage more. So it's not a big uh, difference on how it'll lower your credit score. It's, it's just a small difference, but you know, every, everything adds up. Uh, these are just some, a few of credit card advertising. So like I said, you don't have to really ask for them. Once you turn 18 years old, they usually will just start mailing them to you. Um, so it pays to discover. I'm sure you know a lot of these logos. Don't leave home without it, right? For emergencies, they're trying to tell you in case you're in an emergency or don't live life without it is actually their new logo. Um, and then... Um, for some things money can't buy, for everything else, there's Master MasterCard. So if you can't afford it, it's okay because they're gonna be there. Uh, for Visa, it's everywhere you wanna be, right? So who knows where we wanna be? Um, and then what's in your wallet because you have to have a Capital One credit card in your wallet, right? So these are a lot of those uh, credit card slogans to entice you to use uh, their credit cards. So this is a question that I have. Uh, if you have a lot of credit cards. So this is Rachel, uh, Rachel's current debt situation. So she owes $8,000 on a credit card A and the interest rate is 27%. And she owes 5,000 on credit card B, 22% interest rate and 6,000 on credit card C, 14% interest rate. Uh, and she owes zero on a new credit card that she just got and she can transfer up to $8,000 from her other credit card, right? To pay off the other credit cards because they have a higher interest, right? She would receive 0% interest on this new credit card for six months. And after that, the interest rate goes up to 18%, right? Because they always give you a 0% interest rate to get you to get their credit card for a balance transfer, but then it will go up and you have to know what it's gonna go up to and when, okay? So for this situation, my question is, should Rachel transfer her $8,000 balance her, on credit card A to her new one to credit card D? What are your thoughts? maybe not transfer the full amount to credit card D, mm -hmm. like not the full 8,000, just less of it so that you're, cause she, she has to pay it off anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't okay. know. Okay. That's, that's a good thing. I, I, I realize what you're doing. Okay. I think for this situation, I would probably recommend because 27% is so high. Um, I would recommend transferring the balance um, to her new credit card D because it's 0% interest and she's paying a lot of interest on that credit card A. Um, and then even though it's going to go up to 18%, that's still lower than the 27% she's paying now. The good thing is if she does transfer it, she'll have a zero balance, right, on that credit card A. I kind of covered this already, but so should she close credit card A? And, and as I told you already, she shouldn't. She shouldn't close that credit card A uh, with a 27% uh, interest rate. Actually, what she probably could do is uh, once she pays it off, uh, that credit card's going to realize like, hey, she paid it off. We're not making any money off of her. 
So a lot of times if you call that creditor and ask them to lower that 27% interest rate, they will um, because they're not making any money off of you. So um, once they see that you were able to pay it off, um, a lot of times they will go ahead and lower that interest rate because they still wanna make some money. If they don't, then like I said, like you just store it somewhere, lock it up, don't use it, okay? But, um, but you definitely don't, don't wanna close it and unless you can't trust yourself to not use it. Uh, I don't know if ever, anyone's ever done a balance transfer before on a credit card. I mean, it's just kind of like business. You know what your interest rate is and you move things around. A lot of times they will charge for you to do a balance transfer though. So you have to do, uh, you have to watch what, read the fine print whenever you do a balance transfer because a lot of times there are charges associated with it. On the credit report, uh, it's just like a report card that says how well you manage your finances. So it's a historical record of how and when that you have paid your bills, uh, how much debt you have, and how long you've been managing your credit accounts. So some of those things you can change and some things you can't. So the way that you build that credit score uh, is to keep your credit utilization under 30%, okay? So under 30%. So if they give you on a credit card $100 after $30, you better stop. Okay. So you should know what your credit utilization ratio is for every credit card and make sure it stays under 30. Once it goes under 30, you will see your credit score go up. You never want to get anywhere near your limit on a credit card. Next thing is just paying the bills on time. It seems simple. It makes a whole lot of difference just making sure you pay that bill on time. Next, uh, protecting against fraud. So, you know, there's a lot of skimmers that skim your credit card, uh, steal your identity, things like that. So because of that, you want to make sure that you secure your documents so that you shred things, you know, don't just throw them the way, away when they have your information on them. Uh, you want to make sure that nobody has access to your social security number. Okay. Um, that's very important because when somebody does steal your identity, uh, it takes a long time, a very, very long time to fix that. You have to file a police report, um, contact all the credit bureaus. So it's a very long process that can, can tie you up for a while. And then lastly is a purchasing insurance. You always want to make sure you have insurance. You know, when you, you have credit, it's because you have a job and you're, you're buying things and you're making money. So whatever you buy, you want to protect, right? You're, you're the biggest asset, right? You're the money maker, right? You go to work, so you have to stay healthy, which means you need health insurance to protect yourself um, when you get ill. You're buying a house, a car, property, you, you have to have those things insured, okay? Because even if you pay it on time, it doesn't matter if you don't have insurance and somebody you know, hits your car, you need to have that insurance to protect that investment. Uh, and then life insurance as well. You, know, you could be doing really good credit-wise, but it honestly, it just takes one, one disaster, uh, one death in the family, one hurricane uh, to mess everything up. What does not affect your credit score? So savings, you can have a lot of money in your savings account, but if you are not paying your creditors on time, you're still gonna have a low credit score. Um, your assets, so you can have a house and 10 cars, it doesn't matter, it's not gonna help your credit score. And then your income, so your income as well. You can be making a million dollars a year and somebody can be working at McDonald's making $20,000 a year, but if they pay their items on time and live within their means, they may have a higher credit score than someone that is making a million dollars that's not paying uh, their debts. The three major credit bureaus like we're talking was Equifax, Experion, and TransUnion. Those are the three. So anyone that you get a loan from, they're going to tell you which one they use. And if you have Credit Karma, um, 
they they'll usually give you uh, the different ones. I forgot which one. I think it's Equifax and TransUnion that they use to give you those scores. And then a lot of banking apps now will also give you your credit score. Um, I have a question sure. about the utilization ratio. Mm -hmm. So is that talking about like your credit limit on your card? You should only spend 30% of that? Yes. Month? Yes, exactly. Okay. Exactly. That's why whenever they increase your limit, it helps your credit score because it changed that credit utilization ratio. Gotcha. So, so spending less than 30 will boost your credit score. Yes. Even if you pay off, like if you spend more than 30, even if you pay that off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Credit Karma, it gives you actually what your credit utilization ratio is too. Um, so this is how it's weighed, how your score is weighed um, for your credit. So you can see the biggest chunk is your payment history. So 35% is just paying your bills on time. Okay, so very simple. Just you have to make sure you have them scheduled and keep track of them. Um, the next 30% is how much you owe. So that is going to be your credit utilization. So that's why it affects it so much because it's 30% of the weight of your score. The next one is the length of your credit history. So you know, just depending on when you got your first credit card or bought your first car, you know, when you started using your social for credit. So you can't change that, you know, when you, when you got it, when you started is when you started. Uh, so that length of history. Uh, and then the credit mix is just um, the mixture of different credit types that you have. So you may have revolving credit, like credit cards. You may have installment credits, like a car payment or, uh, or mortgage. Uh, and then there's also service credits, like you're, you're paying for services. Um, so those are the different type of mix. So you want to have a blend. You don't just straight have all credit cards and that's all you have. So if you can have, you have a mixture, that's what that 10% is. And then the new credit is just the new credit cards that you're opening or when your credit is being pulled to check to purchase something new. Any, any questions about that, the credit? I'm sorry, could you go back for just a minute? Yeah. To the last slide. Okay. Yes, right there. So I have a question. Sure. Um, you, in your example about credit cards A, B, C, D, and like you have credit card D and you transfer the balance from credit card A to credit card D. Mm -hmm. um, and then you would be over your 30% of the credit utilization, wouldn't you? Yes. Yeah. Is that worth it? Or should it, you do like a partial, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It depends because you're paying for it. So you're still gonna try to pay those down. The thing is that when you pay, when you transfer to the D, then you're gonna put um, more of, when you pay it, you're gonna pay more on it because more is gonna be not going to interest anymore, it's gonna be going to the principal. So in some instances, it's, it's, it's worth it to do that. I mean, you wanna stay within your 30%, but if you're already way out of your 30%, um, then you, you still wanna get rid of the ones that have the highest interest rate because you're still going to be paying so much money and that interest rate is only going to increase. Um, but then you have those other credit cards that are active that have. Yes. That yeah. are, that are accumulating interest. Right. Right. So you're always going to choose the one that has the highest interest rate and you're okay. going to pay the most on that credit card. Okay. And then to pay the minimums on the, all the other ones. Okay. Thank you. Because now that that 27% is gone, you don't have to pay that one first. So you'll find the one that's the next highest and you'll start paying the most on that one. Okay. What exactly does credit mix mean? So credit mix is a mixture of different types of credit. So it can be revolving credit, like a credit card. 
It can be uh, installment credits, like uh, a credit, um, a car payment that you pay on time, uh, and then service credits. So uh, say you go like to discount tire or you get um, service on your air conditioning or things like that. Um, so it's just a mixture of different types of credit, whether it's like home and then uh, vehicle, credit card. So you don't want it all to be just credit card. You want to have a mixture of different types of credit. What are some good different types of credit to do as a student? Um, well, usually um, if you have a vehicle that's not paid off, then people are paying a car payment. So that would be one type of credit. Um, the credit card's the easiest one because you know they're just gonna give that to you. Um, other credit as a student. That's a good question. I'm trying to think of other, other things that I've had. Service. Phone. Maybe phone service. Yeah, when you pay for your cell, your cell phone bill, mm -hmm. that would be a service credit because you can stop it or cable because that's a service. Yeah, those type of things. Utilities okay. or services. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay, so we're going to go into debt, which I hope nobody has a lot of debt, but debt's a pretty bad word, you know, it's given a bad rap, but there is good debt and then there's bad debt. So uh, as far as good debt, we look at that as loans to purchase items that will go up in value or appreciate uh, and create a revenue stream for you. So some good debts definitely would say is an education, right? Because you're, if you have a loan to pay for tuition in your schooling, um, our hopes is that it's because you will be appreciating because you will be creating a higher revenue stream in the future due to your education. Okay. Um, so that's just an example of a good debt. Bad debt would be loans to purchase items that will go down in value. They will depreciate. Um, so I'm gonna go into some examples of that. However, um, those can always change. A good debt can turn into a bad debt and a bad debt can turn into a good debt depending on how it's used. So appreciation versus depreciation. So college. So we would view college as we're paying a lot of money for our education. Uh, so hopefully it is to appreciate, right? To create a good debt. However, you can turn that college education into a bad debt by usually students say by dropping out and turn it into a bad debt. Because if you accumulate a lot of, a lot of debt paying for your school and then you decide senior year, like, no, I don't wanna do this anymore. You still have to pay all those loans back. Um, so then you turned it into to a bad debt because if in the end, if you don't have a college degree, then it would still be considered a bad debt. Um, now a house. So most people know for a house, um, it is going to appreciate over time. So if you bought a house 20 years ago, it was worth less and it's worth more now, right? Because the value of a home goes up over time. So a ho house will almost always appreciate it's a good investment, right? People say. However, if you didn't get insurance on that house and then you had something like a flood or a hurricane, that would be a way of depreciating that house. Okay. Now a new car is the single most worst investment um, that you could probably ever purchase because a new car will depreciate the minute you drive it off the lot. Okay. It almost never increases in value. It'll always depreciate. Uh, new tennis shoes also, you know, sometimes people spend $300 on, ten, on tennis shoes, um, but usually those are just gonna depreciate, you know, unless you're like somebody famous and then you're gonna sign your name on them and, and sell them, they're just gonna depreciate, you know. Um, however, if you were an athlete, 
then you know those can be used to make you money right uh, business loan can also go either way hopefully you know you get a business loan and start a great business is very successful and earn you lots of money uh, however you know there are bad business investments and it can um, go bankrupt can depreciate um, this one Texan season tickets so we talked about this and usually I was like no that's a, that's a bad debt it's a bad investment it costs a lot of money um, however, you could spend hundreds or thousands of dollars on Texan season tickets that some people may view as like, oh, that's wasting money. It's going to just depreciate. Um, you know, you go to the game and it's over. However, say for example, you bought those season tickets and you only wanted to go to a couple of games. Uh, and then instead you decided to sell those, some of those tickets for a higher price then you created a revenue stream for yourself. So in, in that instance, it could be uh, that it did appreciate, depending on how you use them. Uh, a new suit, that would be an investment. So hopefully a new suit, you know, can be a couple hundred dollars, but if it means that you're gonna go to an interview, you're gonna look sharp, you're gonna impress that employer, uh, and you're gonna earn yourself a, a great salary, then it's in an investment. So it would appreciate and it would be a, a good debt. Uh, new cell phone, um, you know, cell phones are so expensive. You know, they're in the thousands now. Um, they're almost always gonna depreciate because in two years there's gonna be a brand new one. So that's almost always a, a depreciation and would be considered a, a bad debt. However, you know, you need a good cell phone because say you do sales, and you can't live without a really good cell phone, it's going to make you money, then you could claim that that would appreciate and that may be a good debt for you. Does Thank anybody you, have any questions? Mm -hmm. Just in case you're um, not tracking the time, it's 1 10 p.m. Okay, thank you so much. Does anybody have any questions about that? Okay, so whenever you buy something, just remember, is, that, is this a good debt or a bad debt? Is it gonna make me money or? Is it going to depreciate? Um, list of paying down debt. So if you have a lot of debt, first thing you need to do is list all your debts on a spreadsheet. Uh, you want to contact debtors and ask them to reduce your interest rate. It doesn't hurt to try. They may say no, it doesn't matter. At least you tried to get the lowest interest rate. Um, and then you want to pay down the debt with the highest interest rate. Whoever has the highest, that's the one you go to. So that's what you're gonna pay down. Everybody else on the credit card will get the minimum payments. There is a card act which says that actually on the credit card statement, they have to actually show you how it's being paid down. So I'm gonna give you an example of this. This is a credit card statement. And as you can see, it does give you lots of warnings on the minimum payment due when it's due. And it tells you right here, uh, there's a penalty APR of 29.99% and a late fee of $38. This is an American Express, by the way, um, if you don't pay it, right? So whatever interest rate you may have had, if you pay it late, they're gonna increase it to 29.99%, which is extremely high. Um, but right here, this little chart, so you don't have to calculate it out for yourself. You know how much money you're paying. If you're only paying the minimum due, it would take you for this statement 24 years to pay off this credit card. Um, and you would be estimated to pay $30,073. Whereas if you they give you the option, pay $479 a month and you'll pay it off in only three years. Uh, and you'll only pay $17,245. So you can see that extra savings of $12,828 is what you would have been paying them on interest when you're only paying the minimum. Okay, so they kind of give it to you to where you can make the decisions that you need to make. And then it gives you the credit counseling services at the bottom in case you need assistance with paying, paying those. These are just financial tools. So we talked about some of them. Um, so the nerd wallet is if you want to get a credit card, you don't know which one to get. Um, and you want some, um, some resources to finding the best one for you. Mint. Uh, is a good one and also uh, Credit Karma. 
for budgeting, Mint is pretty good. Uh, for saving and investing, Stash and Acorn are good apps to use. Uh, they do connect to your bank, so it will like you can schedule it to take just take five dollars out of my my budget every week, and it will do that. And then you can also program it like if there's less than a hundred dollars in my account, don't touch it. So you can do those as well. For income, there's PaycheckCity.com and Salary.com. You need to know what you should be earning. Um, I like Paycheck City because it actually tells you what you will get in your paycheck according to the state that you're in, the taxes that will be taken out. Uh, you can change the dependence on Paycheck City. It'll tell you if you put, you have one dependent, this is how much you'll get. And if you have two, three, so you can change things around uh, and actually find out what you'll actually receive in your paycheck. And then the student loans, um, just if that's a need for federal student loans, that is the best option when paying for school. And then debt management, that's a, a calculator that will show you how to get rid of your debt. This is my contact information. If you think of any questions um, that you would like to ask, and they can be more uh, elaborate questions, more advanced questions, like I said, about taxes or investing or, or what should I do with this situation, you can feel free, free to um, email me. Feel free to email me, C. Olmedo at central.uh.edu and I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank y'all for participating. Uh -huh. You have any questions? Uh, yeah, about credit. Mm -hmm. uh, can being an authorized user on someone else's credit card affect your credit score? Yes. Okay, and what if you uh, take your name off of it? Will that automatically lower it, like closing an account? That I'm not, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, I have. To, I would have to check on that. Okay. Yeah, because I, I just looked at my credit report and I didn't realize I was an authorized user on someone else's, and they're uh -huh. not very good with money. Yeah. I guess. You definitely want to be careful with that. Um, don't let other people use your credit ever. Yeah. Okay. okay. Other thing is, it's going to carry with you. Uh, say later when you, uh, you know, you get married or you want to buy a house or whatever. Um, the amount the type of house that you buy is going to depend on both of your credit, how much money y'all are making and both of your credit. So if one of you has a really good credit score and the other one does not, it's going to be a combination of both. Okay. okay. So it's very important that the other person uh, is also uh, very knowledgeable about their finances. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other Thank questions? You. Thank you, Ms. Cynthia, for the workshop. Um, I have one more question. Okay. Is there any way that you can break down, uh, where is it? Can you break down the current budget and the living percentage more? Like how much, I guess you would be spending monthly on things that everybody needs like groceries or gas or whatever. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you can. And there is a budget that breaks every little thing down, like your cable bill, your cell bill. Yes. Would you like me to send you something like that? Yeah, that would be awesome. Great. If you, if you just want to email me, then I will send you that. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No problem. All right, well, I guess I'm going to be signing out. Thank you for attending the workshop. Um, and let me know if you have any questions you think of later. Thank you very much. Thanks.